For this Sunday's shipwreck video, I decided to change things up a little. Instead of covering one specific ship, or one specific battle, I am going to look at four of the more unique shipwrecks in the world. There are other ships I can cover in this way, of course. World Discoverer, for example, is quite popular in this kind of video. However, I want to cover ships that get less interest. While one of my chosen examples is fairly well known, the others aren't looked at nearly as much. This in spite of two of them being the rare case of a shipwreck that you can walk around on. That's interesting to me, considering there are very few war shipwrecks where you can do that. With that in mind, let's get into it, starting with the largest wreck on this list, and the best known for that matter. As could be expected, sunken battleships are a pretty popular topic. The Queens of the Sea were the flagship of fleets and the most powerful weapons afloat. So, when one of them sank, it automatically drew interest. Regardless of how the ship actually sank, be it in combat or in peacetime. There's one of these ships, though, that is quite different from any other. After all, horizontal shipwrecks are a dime a dozen. How many times do you see a vertical shipwreck? HMS Victoria is one of two examples that come to mind, and I'll be looking at the other one later in the video. For now, let's look at one of the most awkward sinkings in Royal Navy history. One of the most unique battleship designs to ever sail the seas, HMS Victoria was only three years old at the time of her sinking. Carrying her main battery in a single massive bow turret, Victoria was one of the last battleships with a dangerously low freeboard. This was a result of carrying such a heavy turret and a compromise to maintain stability. Unfortunately, this low freeboard caused issues of its own. In service, Victoria and her sister had a distressing tendency of their foredeck vanishing from view beneath the waves, even in relatively calm waters. There are other issues with the design, which I can cover in a dedicated video. For now, that issue with the freeboard is the important one. This was a ship that was already incredibly bow-heavy, even in ideal circumstances. So, when she was caught in one of the most infamous turns in naval history, the ship was ill-equipped to survive it. On June 22nd, 1893, Victoria was leading the Mediterranean fleet. They were participating in an otherwise routine exercise, as all navies do in peacetime. However, the admiral in command, George Tryon, ordered a fleet-wide turn. In simplest terms, the fleet was split into two squadrons. The squadrons would then turn in towards each other while reversing course. Ideally, this would have the formations sailing beside each other in a perfect reversal. Tryon kept the squadrons far too close to each other for that to work. Only 1,200 yards apart, with Victoria having a turning circle, more like 1,600 yards. Things went wrong pretty much immediately. HMS Camperdown, at the head of the other squadron, slammed into Victoria. As this was the era where ships still carried ram bows, this had the expected result. Victoria began flooding immediately and rapidly. The heavy weight of her turret dragged Victoria down by the bow as her crew struggled to close watertight doors. Within eight minutes, her bow was flooded and her stern was nearly out of the water. By the time 13 minutes had passed since the collision, Victoria capsized. She sank bow first, with her propellers still rotating. 358 men were lost with the ship, including men in the engine rooms who never received an order to evacuate. As Victoria sank, her heavy bow and still turning shafts drove her down. Even when a ship sinks by the bow, it generally does so gradually. Victoria seems to have gone down like an arrow, driving her bow 30 meters, about 100 feet, into the mud. This resulted in the situation the wreck was found in, 111 years after she sank. On August 22, 2004, Victoria's wreck was found by Christian Francis and Mark Elliott. I apologize if I butchered that name. When they found her, the battleship was resting upright. Her bow was driven into the bottom, with the rest of the ship pointing toward the surface. As the ship rests in only 140 meters, 460 feet of water, 
Her stern is fairly close to the surface. Victoria was, after all, 340 feet, 100 meters, long. Even with a good chunk of her buried in the mud, the stern reaches pretty high up. This means that her wreck is a relatively easy dive, at least for the parts closer to the surface. Victoria's status as a vertical wreck makes her a very popular diving spot. Shallow bow ships that you can dive on are, honestly, pretty rare. Diving one where you can see her stern pointing straight up, that's even more rare. Almost unique, and considering the difficulty in diving on the other prominent example, it might as well be a one-off. Unfortunately, while a popular diving spot, it is not one that has much in the way of easily accessible pictures. Videos, yes, and I'll link them in the description, but not pictures. From watching these videos, and the few pictures online, it's apparent that Victoria is in extremely good condition. This is a ship that's been vertical, in shallow water, for over a century. Not only has she not collapsed at all, but the ship has relatively little sea growth on her hull. Guns, aside from the buried four turret, are still in place and recognizable. And, of course, her shafts and propellers, or screws, are still in place, pointing towards the surface. The rudder is still mounted between them, as well. All of this makes Victoria one of the most interesting shipwrecks out there, and one that is fairly easy to dive. At least if you stick towards the stern. I'm not going to say how long she'll remain as she is, of course. I can't imagine the stresses on her resting frame. Eventually, at some point in the future, her keel will break and the ship will collapse. If you're a qualified diver, this is one wreck that you would want to visit sooner rather than later. But with that said, let's look at the other warship sticking up towards the surface. While Victoria has limited pictures to work with, she at least has a good amount of video out there. The same cannot be said for the Russian monitor, Ruzalka. There is some level of irony when talking about Ruzalka and Victoria. Both ships sank in 1893 within a few months of each other. Both ships ended up driven into the bottom, with their stern pointing almost straight up. It's an interesting historical oddity, the kind of thing that historians love for just how unlikely it really is. However, the story of Ruzalka is a less interesting tale than that of Victoria. Launched in 1867, this monitor saw an uneventful service career. She spent her entire life in the Russian Baltic fleet, largely on training duty. By the time she sank in 1893, Ruzalka was reduced to a coast defense ironclad. Even so, in spite of her age and lack of capability, the monitor remained in service. Until, that is, September 7, 1893. On that day, Ruzalka sailed out in company with a gunboat. Not long after leaving port, a massive storm descended on the Baltic. Gale force winds and rain whipped the sea to a frenzy, causing the gunboat to lose track of Ruzalka. Nothing would ever be found on the monitor again, other than a dead sailor in a raft. Even the initial searching of the seabed found nothing. It was as if Ruzalka had up and vanished although it was fairly obvious that the storm had overwhelmed her. The Russians reprimanded the admiral who had let the monitor sail into the rough weather, but other than that, Ruzalka largely faded from memory. Aside from a monument constructed in honor of her lost crew in 1902. As for her wreck, well, an early attempt to find her came in 1932. The Soviets claimed to have found the monitor, though they made no attempt to salvage her and the position they gave for Ruzalka's resting place is not where the ship actually is. Either they were lying through their teeth, or they recorded the wrong location. Either way, Ruzalka would not be properly identified until 2003, 110 years after her sinking. Continuing the parallels with Victoria here, as the battleship was found in 2004. When it comes to Ruzalka, an expedition by the Estonian Maritime Museum is what located her. They did this on July 22, 2003, to be specific. The monitor was found in 74 meters, 243 feet, of water. As with Victoria, Ruzalka is driven into the mud 
at an almost vertical angle. About half of the poor ship is buried in the bottom, with the rest draped in fishing nets as it points towards the surface. Ruzalka sank in what is, to this day, a fairly busy shipping lane, with all that implies. This makes her a difficult wreck to dive for several reasons. The fact she is fairly far from shore in a busy shipping lane is one of them. The nets are another, as even the most experienced diver can get caught in netting and drown in a panic. I am not surprised she is in a popular diving spot, really. Not to mention the Baltic is a freezing dive at the best of times. In any case, Ruzalka is still an interesting wreck, difficulty aside. The tip of the stern points up at a 90 degree angle, at around 108 feet 33 meters above the seafloor. Her aft turret has fallen out, with the bow turret buried in the mud. That said, the thing that's notable about Ruzalka is that her rudder is turned to starboard. This has created a theory about her sinking, though it must be noted this is just a theory. With Victoria, there was a fleet worth of witnesses to her sinking, along with survivors. Ruzalka sank alone and unobserved, so anything about her sinking is just guesswork. With that disclaimer done, the theory goes as follows. Ruzalka was likely taking on water in her bow. The low freeboard of a monitor, plus the stormy weather, likely combining to drive water through hatches. With her already low freeboard getting lower by the second, when her captain ordered a turn, it doomed the monitor. It is possible that she was trying to get back to port. However, the turn would have put her bow even lower in the rough water. Ruzalka would have, most likely, capsized at that point. The weight of water, the heavy seas, and the turn all combining to flip her over. Just like Victoria, her heavy bow and still-turning engines drove her to the bottom in a near-vertical descent, driving her into the mud, leaving the monitor half-buried and pointing straight up in the modern day. Unfortunately, in addition to the other issues I listed, Ruzalka is also a very muddy wreck. Visibility isn't great on her, from what I've been able to find. This likely contributes to the lack of pictures or video. I'll toss a couple links to videos on her wreck in the description as well, but it's all close-in footage, and only her propellers and rudder are really recognizable. As such, I'll leave Ruzalka here, and move on to the final pair of ships. The final two wrecks are tied together by virtue of being ships of the same class. A massive class that, in spite of the large numbers, left behind very few wrecks. These were the Clemsons, the ultimate evolution of American four-stacker destroyer design. Over 150 of these ships were built, yet they left behind few intact wrecks. The two most intact ones that I'm aware of are the focus of this section. These are the final two Clemsons that you can still see in the modern day or, at the least, see what is left of them. These two destroyers are USS Thompson, DD-305, and USS Corey, DD-334. The reason that these destroyers are still around, if in badly corroded form, is simple. They were both sold for scrapping in 1930, but the scrapping wasn't completed. This result means that they escaped combat and sinking in action, as well as the Scrapper's Torch. That makes them special in the Clemson class, because you can go visit the wrecks and see what's left of them. Let's start with Thompson. She was sold for scrap in June of 1930. This process saw her stripped of weapons and other valuable equipment, before her hulk apparently ended up as a floating restaurant in San Francisco Bay. Thompson remained in that state for a good bit of the 1930s, though I'm not sure how successful she actually was. What I can say, though, is that the Navy bought her back in 1944. Not for combat service, naturally. They had no need for another Clemson hull that would have had to been refit for any sort of work. Instead, the Navy bought Thompson with the intention to sink her in the mud of the bay, whereupon both Army and Navy aircraft could use her hulk as a target for bombing practice. And there she remains to this day. The Navy didn't bother refloating Thompson to scrap her. They simply left her hulk in place, silently rusting away in the mud. 
Because of this, intrepid visitors can row out to her and climb aboard what's left of Thompson. Not that there is much left, and it's apparently a difficult trip if the water is in flat calm. So probably best to leave this to people familiar with the area, if you want to try. In any event, Thompson, the South Bay Wreck as she's known today, is hardly recognizable as a Clemson. Most of her hull above the waterline is long gone, with only a badly corroded fragment remaining. This sad remnant does have visible portholes, I suppose. Or at least it did have portholes in the pictures that I've been able to find. Regardless, for a long time, Thompson had a lonely bit of hull sticking up from an otherwise destroyed hulk. If you actually make it out to her at low enough tide, there's more to see, though. You can walk along what's left of her waterline. And, looking at her from above, you can still see the Clemson-class hull form just beneath the surface. All of that being said, however, Thompson is still a relatively difficult wreck to reach. Her sister, USS Corey, is a much easier wreck to get to. This is not the Corey I had previously covered, sunk off of Normandy. The Clemson-class USS Corey was sold for scrap in 1930, just like Thompson. This saw her towed off to Mare Island for scrapping, which only saw her superstructure and forward hull pulled off. Like Thompson, she was never completely torn apart. Unlike Thompson, Corey wasn't turned into a restaurant. Instead, she was towed off as a breakwater in the Napa River. Her wreck is resting right next to shore, with much of it exposed to the air. In fact, if you look at her on Google Earth, she's still clearly visible. Much as with Thompson, the lines of a Clemson destroyer are easy to see. However, on Corey, most of the hull remains intact above the waterline. This allows for a curious visitor to walk up, climb aboard, and take a look around. Sure, she's missing most of the interesting bits. Even so, this is the closest anyone will ever get to walking the decks of a four-stacker destroyer in the modern day. The deterioration of Corey's Hulk has picked up a bit lately, but she's still mostly intact in comparison to a lot of wrecks, including her sister ship. I would suggest visiting soon if you're at all interested in her and are able to make the trip. I suspect she'll collapse into the water completely, relatively soon. With that though, we come to the end of this video. Again, I'm aware of other wrecks like these. Cerberus, for example, is a fairly famous example of what Corey and Thompson are. But, as I said at the beginning, I want to look at ships that don't see as much interest. Victoria aside, of course. Thank you for watching, remember to like, comment, and subscribe if you enjoy the content, and I'll see you in the next one.